the galaxy burns. The heretic falls. And the emperor protects. Welcome, citizens of the Imperium. My name is Doug, and with me, as always, is my co-host with the Mo-host, Dan. How you doing, buddy? I'm doing great, friend. Yeah, and so today we are going to really dig into our coverage here of the Horus Heresy, beginning where it all began at the beginning of the actual, like, what, the first book series? I mean, before it was even a game system, um, Horus Rising. So that's by Dan Abnett, if I'm not mistaken, and uh, it's got a great story. You did a great coverage of it, Dan, and uh, we'll be covering that today. So uh, before we dig in, just wanted to give a shout out to all the thank you. There's a bunch of people who sent in a few questions, and we want to start doing that uh, going forward. If you have a question you'd like for us, go ahead and leave it uh, wherever you are seeing and or hearing this. <laughs> I put okay. it on a bunch of places. <laughs> Dan, uh, give us kind of a brief preview of what we're chatting about. What are we going to cover in Horus Rising? So what we're going to do, uh, Doug, is kind of do a prequel yes there is a prequel to the heresy <laughs> and we're gonna have you start out and talk about something called the unification wars mm -hmm. which is really what led up to this crusade that we're going to talk about it really introduces us to who this emperor guy is and who these space marine people are and just give people some context for diving into the heresy because horus rising interestingly enough is a book that actually is taking place almost 200 years into something called the Great Crusade. Yes. So it's it's not like it's just out the gate. Uh, and having this other information, I think, would be really helpful for the listeners. And then we're going to talk people through uh, the main points of the book and, and some things of interest that we found as we were looking through it. Yep, that's a fantastic summary. So... Uh, I'm going to do a bit of a sum up of 30,000 years of human lore. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and I <laughs> hope you guys are ready for the test. <laughs> yeah, right. right. Uh, okay, so to kind of give our preamble before we jump into the starting point of the Horus Heresy, we need to understand mankind has already blossomed and wilted once before. And by that I mean uh, we used up all our available resources here on earth. We were able to build lighter than, uh, sorry, faster than light travel, as well as machines to change environments, doing all kinds of like terraforming and stuff. Yeah. And we spread out amongst the stars at an accelerated rate, because if you figure, you know, a colonization fleet lands on a planet and they totally reform it into a mine, they can build 10 more ships that all go and do the same thing elsewhere. So a very exponential growth. And it was just defined by t technical supremacy as well as enlightenment of all kinds of people. So like there was a, like no religion, that kind of stuff for the most part, I believe. And in a time of, at a period of time that is just kind of briefly known. And again, we're going to do dedicated videos to this stuff in the future during a time called the dark age of technology or the age of strife. Uh, those two kind of go hand in hand. Uh, mankind essentially fell apart. Uh, we yeah. largely lost the ability to communicate and travel towards one another. Everyone became an island. Uh, alien races were then able to just kind of pick us apart across the stars. Uh, anything you want to interject there? No, I, I think that's a great summary of okay. It takes us up to <laughs> the happenings back on Mother Earth or Terra, as we exactly. Call it now. Yep. And so, uh, what the unification wars were was essentially some guy just walks up and goes, I am the emperor of mankind, which, <laughs> yeah. you know, it's a tough start, but to a conversation. <laughs> um, I feel like most of the people, if they said that to me, I'd be like, are you wearing a trash bag for a helmet? Okay, cool. Awesome. I get it. <laughs> you got my vote. But anyway, uh, so this guy comes up, says he's the Imperium, and he has an immense amount of scientific knowledge. Now, keep in mind that in this age of strife era our understanding of technology has regressed almost like how there were lost treasures of the ancients back to our medieval mm. times forefathers sure. you know you and i in our generation have never uh felt the experience of true lost knowledge like on a mythical level and so they have machines that like seem like magic and they don't understand it and all of a sudden this guy the emperor walks up and he gets it at least to some extent he doesn't know everything He's not omnipotent, but he does 
truly understand the technology, and he's able to create the first batch of genetically altered soldiers, uh, generally called the Thunder Warriors. Is that correct? Yeah. That's it. Boom. Yeah. We're crushing this. We're crushing this uh, <laughs> <laughs> This sum up. Okay. So um, he goes around, and, and the Thunder Warriors, they have all kinds of, uh, we'll say, technical issues, um, problems with how they, how functional they are, how stable they are. So, you know, they're a great soldier for conquering and uniting all of Earth under one Imperium. Uh, but going further, he needs something more. And so him and a bunch of the best scientists he has begin work on a basically how do we make a genetic super soldier that is stable like to the core exactly what we want a genetic blueprint for the ultimate warrior he um designs what is it a full 20 of these genetic templates that all exemplify the best parts uh, Mm -hmm. frankly of himself and um (coughs) 20 sort of clones sort of not you know like they're they're based on his dna but not identical um were created these are the primarchs and from their genetic codes uh kind of acting as an intermediary between the divine emperor and the common man all of the primarchs uh their dna could be manipulated to turn normal people into space marines space marines were created and their first you know the Imperium itself, I'm just going to throw my cards on the table, has a lot of ties to uh, fascist Germany back in yes. World War II. There's a lot of allegorical stuff. And to say, there's an old saying that like the first place that the, the Nazis conquered was Germany. Yeah. And um, the first place the Imperium ruled was Terra. And by that, I mean it yeah. It had to subdue all of the elements that were there. So there are entire histories for these legions, these uh, soldiers based off these genetic manipulations and they have these huge rich histories before they ever even leave the planet because it was the first thing he had to conquer he then hooks up with the adeptus mechanicus who have been isolated on mars which i'm sure we could get to mars but like it was its own jam for a long time yes um basically they make a deal that's why we have the twin headed eagle one head is the imperium the other is mechanicus mm-hmm. or mechanicum and uh, the imperium as we now know it is formed and they start going out into the galaxy and trying to reclaim all of the planets one of the things i think is of interest here is yeah. that um you know when when the emperor negotiated with the mechanicum he serves as a deity to them they consider mm-hmm. him something called the Omnissiah. So they literally are worshiping him as a god, which is so emperor, because this guy is, you know, whenever things are convenient, he makes exceptions like this, because as part of the unification war you had talked about, mm-hmm. he basically wiped out any trace of religion. I mean, there's a short story by Graham McNeil called The Last Church. And literally the last church on earth is burnt by the emperor, burnt to the ground. So he was very much uh, secular, you know, rationalization Mm -hmm. and reasoning and science. And the fact, and he was very much against being worshipped as a god. And yet when he goes to Mars, he was like, it's cool. You guys do what you want to (laughs) do. Yeah. What? Okay, fine. Whatever. It's it's the inconsistencies and those little allowances, you know, it's crazy. <laughs> it, is. it is. Yeah. Um, so we're getting close to the Horus heresy here. Essentially, you yeah. know, with the Mechanicum, they're spreading back out. They find old Mechanicus forge worlds that are still intact. They find planets still under rule. Mm-hmm. Um, just to breeze through, they have to fight back a bunch of alien races. Like I said, they've now invaded and peppered in side note, slight asterisk. There's not a whole lot of information, you know, about this, but at some point chaos got in and scattered all the primarchs to the winds. Mm -hmm. Like, I feel like that was never really well explained, but, um, (laughs) as a plot contrivance, a MacGuffin hole opens up inside the Imperium household (laughs) and it takes all 20 of the primarchs, uh, and shoots them across the galaxy. And so as the emperor is reclaiming them in this grand crusade, this great crusade, uh, he's finding his genetic sons and then kind of reinstating them in charge of the legions that have 
their genetic code that they're based off of. Mm -hmm. So he'll find one named Fulgrim. Fulgrim, these are the boys that were based off of you. And he, they just click like together. Um, (laughs) and so that's going to be a, that's going to be a big thing because essentially once you start to twist the leader, it all kind of gets really, really murky. Um, yeah. The last big bastion of aliens, at least at the time, um, that was a huge threat to the Imperium, was a huge orc army on the planet of Olinor. Yes. Um, and so a bunch of the Space Marine chapters, because right, it's, it's Sons of Horus. I know the Emperor was there. Who else was there? Well, there were, I believe, nine, eight or nine uh, chapters, and everybody's still loyalists. Yeah. So they were all there. Um, obviously, the Imperial Army yep. uh, that the Emperor created was there. The Mechanicus was there. Mm-hmm. Mechanicum was there. Uh, and just, yeah, pretty much yeah. just hundreds of thousands of soldiers and Space Marines. Yep. I mean, it's a, yeah, it's one of the biggest deployments of Space Marines in one place at a time, which <laughs> bigger ones would come later because of the heresy. But, you know, whatever. But yeah, essentially the orcs are crushed, and at that point the emperor says, you know, he's now satisfied that his the Great Crusade is at its crest, and so he can go back to Terra and begin working on a secret project. We'll cover that later. Mm-hmm. Uh, and Horus begins to grow resentful for this, and that pretty much dovetails us straight into the book we're talking about today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so Ulanor is the planet that this happens on. Uh, and it's got some other significance uh, in the story in that, for example, later in the heresy, the chaos legions actually carry on, uh, carry out a decimation where they yeah. sacrifice 10 percent, one out of every 10 of their uh, slaves to kind of ensure their safe travel through the warp. And there is a planet in 40K that many people are familiar with, which is Armageddon. And. Mm-hmm. This planet literally was Ulanor. It's amazing yeah. when you find that out. You're like, oh, my God, my brain just blew up. <laughs> so Ulanor has a lot of significance in the books. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Um, so that's that brings us to now. So, um, Dan, you wrote a, a fantastic oh, play-by-play of, of the book idea. Horus Rising. And um, – yeah, why don't you walk through it with us, and I'm happy to interject here and there with a sure. few thoughts. But So this this book and the start of this book is taking place about 200 years after the start of the Great Crusade you talked about. Yes. And uh, they are – it's interesting. So when a planet gets named in the heresy, what you get is you get the number of the expedition fleet mm-hmm. that, you know, the – is conquering the planet or, or, you know, reconstituting it, com- make, putting it into compliance, I think is the words we hear, and then the number of the planet. So, for example, uh, they're on a planet called 6319. It's the 63rd yep. expedition fleet and the 19th planet that they have uh, brought into compliance. So yep. he's been War Master for about a year at this point, mm-hmm. and uh, he has a group of people uh, that he th- – and this is not just – it's not unique to Horus, but he has something called, called the Mornival. And what it is, is it's four Marines from his Luna Wolves, which are his legion at the time. And yep. they act kind of as a council of advisors. Yeah. So uh, he's got four people on it at the time of the book starts. He's got um, Abaddon, who a lot of people are familiar with that name. Uh, Abaddon is very uh, bellicose. He's very aggressive. You have Captain Targadon. And Targadon is very, I would say, pragmatic. Yes, uh, but he's that's very a great well balanced. Word. You have another guy named Aximund, and he is just an arrogant ass. <laughs> and, and then you have a, another guy named Sejanus. And uh, Sejanus is probably the most balanced. And I think the one I would judge from reading the book, I think Horace trusts him the most of the four. I think so. Uh, at the time. And so they arrive on this planet, 6319, and uh, Horus wants to send an envoy to meet with the leadership of the planet. Well, he chooses Sejanus because he trusts him to be able to negotiate the best. Mm -hmm. Well, the people on this planet uh, are not happy when (laughs) Sejanus says that they are there uh, on behalf of the emperor because they believe that they already have an emperor. They're very put out (laughs) that 
someone even suggested there's another emperor and he is brutally murdered yeah. um, by the ruler of the planet. And so negotiations over, <laughs> it's time to crush these guys. And uh, the death of Sejanus has a lot of repercussions. Uh, but at the time, Horus goes, okay, we're done. I'm sending in four companies of my Marines. And uh, yeah, they mm -hmm. crush crush these people. And one of the most famous lines in the heresy books is someone says, I was there when Horus killed the emperor. And everybody's like, oh my gosh, unbelievable foreshadowing. You know, but it's when he killed the emperor on 63. Yes, yeah, and, on this backwater it, planet. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's supposed to be straightforward that you should understand that. But if you know anything, you're like, oh, wow. Um, so, so there's a battle and... Horus actually comes in and he does kill the emperor. Uh, he ends the battle. Mm -hmm. But this is not the end of resistance on the planet. There's still course. people who are holding out. The other thing that happens before we move on with the kind of compliance of the entire planet is Sejanus is dead now. So we need to find a replacement on the mortal. Mm -hmm. And this is where we're introduced to our character, um, Garville Loken. Yes. And... Loken is an excellent replacement for Sejanus because he is um, very balanced. He uh, he's very noble. Uh, he I think empathy is a big thing that Loken has for just human beings, which Absolutely. a lot of space marines don't have. Certainly, uh, Axiom and Abaddon don't. Uh, mm -hmm. And so, just a great choice uh, to replace uh, Sejanus. And he's kind of taken back when he first is. <laughs> uh, first is picked but um there's a, an individual that we will talk about whose name is kirill sinderman and i guess in terms of um you know what how can we explain what he does he's kind of like a priest he's a priest yeah. for something called the imperial truth and why don't you talk to us about what that imperial truth is because that is really important in the heresy absolutely so um the imperial truth is essentially uh, I guess we would call it the party line, so to speak, uh, which is there is no religion. Um, science and truth uh, are the inherent destinies of mankind. We are the rightful heirs of uh, the Milky Way galaxy. Xenos are to be purged. It's just it's like a it's like a religious worldview system, but without ceremony or a deity or anything like that. But it has that same indoctrination tactics that you see on like some cults and stuff like that but it's meant to give all, all the citizens enough answers to not question things really to go searching too far in any direction scientifically or philosophically um yeah is that a good sum up <laughs> it's yeah, it's no, that's it's, great. it's so, all the worst parts of of very very strict religion without any religion at, you know what i mean <laughs> right yeah right no worship uh, yeah so Sinderman, all orthodox no religion <laughs> um, but Loken and he are very close in fact Loken goes to him for advice all the time and uh, so Sinderman kind of says to him wait a minute I'm telling you that you should take this position because Loken wasn't sure because he would act as a balance against Abaddon and Axamon uh, and also later interestingly enough Rogel Dorn who is at one of these primarchs you talked about he also tells Loken kind of on the low key there that, Hey, I recommended you to Horus, you know? So it's like, mm -hmm. Oh God, a Primarch recommended me. Um, yeah. Logan still has some doubts though. Interestingly enough about, about the invasion of the planet and how it's been suppressed and the, the conquest of the planet. And related to this, interestingly enough, there's another human. Uh, his name is Carcasey. And he is like a poet, I guess, is the best mm -hmm. way to put it. Um, and he's on the planet after they kind of suppress everything. And he's out kind of drinking too much. And he kind of talks about how he thinks that, you know, this is just the first of many uh, bad things that are happening. We shouldn't have conquered this planet. We should have tried harder to get along with these people and so forth. And he basically gets the crap beaten out of him by a bunch of Imperial Army guys. <laughs> and Loken finds out about this and he's like, well, you know, I had the same kind of doubts. It was really interesting. So you see Loken 
at this point starting to have doubts. And that's really important, I think, for the story. Yeah. Uh, and anything else you want to add I, at uh, that point? Yeah, absolutely. There's there's one quote. And um, so on, I have a Kindle and you can see like other you know people who are signed up for the program, what they highlight for oh, like sure. important quotes. <laughs> and this one was highlighted more than any others. And it's Loken essentially asking, why couldn't have we just left them alone? Like, <laughs> the, you know, they weren't barbarians. They had a unification of their own, you know, like they... It was fine. They were fine. And yeah. uh, Cinderman, this member of the state who proselytizes, I guess, the virtues of the government. Yeah. Um, his quote is, you're walking along the shores of a lake, Cinderman said. A boy is drowning. Do you let him drown because he was foolish enough to fall into the water before he had learned to swim? Or do you fish him out and you teach him how to swim? And Loken shrugged the latter. <laughs> Well, what if he fights you, uh, fights off your attempts to save him because he's afraid of you, because he doesn't want to learn how to swim? Mm -hmm. And uh, Loken replies, I save him anyway. But I I love that line because <sighs> it is simultaneously the perfect line that the Imperium would give you of like, well, yeah, it's a no brainer. You save the kid. He doesn't understand. But mm. on a, if you just take a step back a little bit, it's like, yeah, but it missed the point of the question which is the boy wasn't drowning he was just standing there Ooh. you know and like this planet they were fine they didn't need us <laughs> well and yeah I, know, I just i thought it was a beautiful piece of writing that is excellent and it brings up the issue of the whole use of the term compliance yes you know what does that really mean it seems like it's just a euphemism for conquest. Yes, yeah. You know, yeah. Through the, and you see it more and more and more. So yep. it, it's very interesting how – that was an excellent quote that Doug gave. Yeah, it was just um, space colonialism. Yeah, it's not good. Yeah, no. <laughs> um, and so that we've met two of these uh, people called remembrancers. We need to talk about that real briefly. Yes, yes, that When this happened, when – you know, the emperor left. He wanted somebody called Remembrances to kind of record everything that was happening. So we've talked about a poet who's Carcasey. We had iterators. That's the word we use for somebody like Cinderman, who's a, a priest, essentially. Yeah. Uh, we have documentarists, like as historians. And we have imagists who are photographers, basically. So our historian is somebody named Mercedes Olaton, and she will be in the story up until the siege, she's yep. in for a long time. And then if Freddy Keeler, who is a central character in the Horus mm -hmm. heresy in the siege, and she is a, a photographer, essentially, is yeah. what she does. But those all four of those play out an important part in, in this. Um, Absolutely. So we get we move on from this. And so Horus and his equerry, who is Malagurst, who we he will be a permanent character here. Uh, what they do is they kind of convince, or another word would be manipulate, the yeah. Mournival into suggesting an assault on what I think we can consider the last rebel stronghold, and it's in place in a place called the Whisperheads. Hmm. Yep. I be called that. <laughs> All right. Um, so the Imperial Army, who is separate from the Space Marines. Uh, the predecessor to the Imperial Guard or Astra Militarum, but they were not called those then. They were called the Imperial Army. Uh, they have not been able to breach this stronghold. So Horus wants his legions to, to kind of be at the forefront here. So uh, Loken's 10th company, Garville Loken's uh, company, is chosen to lead the assault with uh, mm -hmm. elements of the Imperial Army. And so... <laughs> Interesting stuff happens here. It seems like a really small part of the story, but it is so significant. When they're approaching this place, they start hearing like weird radio messages about this thing called Samus, and we don't know what it is. Uh, Logan kind of blows it off. He thinks it's Vox distortion, or he thinks maybe it's Psy Warfare or something else. It's just like Samus is here. Beware of Samus. You know, and there's screams mm -hmm. and all this other stuff that go on. And look, it's just like, whatever. You know, it, it's just uh, they're just trying to, you know, psych us out. Right. <laughs> um, well, part of this uh, approach here and something else that's important is there's a mm -hmm. new weapon that's been introduced to the Luna Wolves, which is Terminator armor, which is yes. very ubiquitous to the story. Um, so they basically 
these Terminators just knock the rebels out. There's there's like they, they just kind of there's no contest. Yeah. <laughs> Each and, one's a moving castle. <laughs> um, so they get into this fortress, this stronghold, but something's wrong. Mm-hmm. And one of the sergeants, one of Loken's sergeants, his name is Jubal, he says he's seen Samus. And Loken's like, what? He, yeah. So he rushes to Jubal where he is, and he seems really confused. Uh, and when Loken and some other Marines like move towards him, he starts opening fire. And he's screaming, Samus is here, Samus is here. And Loken's forced to kill his own sergeant mm-hmm. because he's killing other Marines. Now, during all this, we have some remembrancers because, you know, you have to bring the press along. Of course. Uh, even <laughs> even, even 10,000 years ago, right? <laughs> so um, they've kind of been allowed to observe the assault. Mm-hmm. Uh, and Loken is really confused about what's happening. Uh, he, he doesn't know. So he calls on Cinderman, who's kind of personal advisor. And Cinderman's like, no, it's good. It's okay. It, it, the guy is delusional or. Yeah. Something so, must've gotten into his head. Yeah. Did something. Right. Um, and so Loken had this concept of a demon, something possessing him, but Cinderman's no, 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 no. It's, it's fine. It's okay. That's not what it is. Mm-hmm. And Loken's convinced until Jubal gets up after dying. <laughs> And yes, he becomes possessed. He like blows up into this huge, like mutated creature, and he attacks everybody. Uh, <laughs> so of course the press can't keep their distance, and so no. if Freddy Keeler, who's one of the people we talked about, she gets closer, and she kind of got away from her Imperial Army minders, and she goes right up to where Loken and the Space Marines are fighting Jubal. Um, so Jubal charges them, and the, Jubal kills some of the Marines, but Loken saves Keeler because she almost dies, and he kills Jubal, finally kills him. He's really dead now. Uh, so do you have any comment on it up to now, like what's going on? Uh, no, I, I, I love it because they're slow rolling people discovering the nature of chaos, like <laughs> – yeah. together with them and so i like that the only thing i wanted to touch on is uh, i really did appreciate the slow relationship build between loken and the remembrancer that's with her him constantly um is it mercedes and so yeah mercedes there we go like i, I don't know i just wanted to quote that i think that's a wonderful relationship that they have oh yeah 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 like he's, their rapport they build over time she's, she's kind of <laughs> like his therapist <laughs> yeah exactly yeah it's right it's right um so we're done now with this battle. Jubal's dead, whatever. So Abaddon finds out and he's like, Loken, shut the heck up. Don't <laughs> talk about what you saw. See how you're thinking about it? What you got to do is not think about it. <laughs> <laughs> right. Typical Abaddon. Now Horus arrives and he's like, you know, puts his, you can just picture it, putting his, his hand on Loken's shoulder. And come, come here. I need to talk to you for a minute. Yeah, dude. And so he explains that there's something called the warp. Um, and, and Jubal was possessed by a being that lived in the warp. And he's like, he still he still keeps away from the demon thing. He's like, they're not really demons. They're Xenos. They're, they're you know, alien creatures. Mm-hmm. And so Logan's thoughts are that only people with psychic powers are able to be touched by this warp entity thing. That's what he was taught. And then Horace goes, well, there are places where the warp and reality are really close together. And sometimes that threshold breaches. There's an opening. Yep. And those warp entities, these Xenos, are able to cross over more easily. And so the Whisper Heads, okay, now we know why it's called that, uh, was a place like that. It was mm-hmm. this place of weakness between the warp and reality. Uh, and then he tells Loken of the Emperor's Basement Project, which <laughs> it's a euphemism for the craziness that the emperor tells nobody about yep. something that's going on. And this is one of the emperor's, and this is opinion, Dan's opinion. It is one of the major, if not <laughs> the major mistake the emperor made was not telling people what was going on there. Yep. And there's no Hilarious. reason he shouldn't have told his primarchs. Yep. So, so that's kind of the resolution to this uh, whisper heads thing. Anything mm-hmm. else for you that was significant or interesting? Uh, no, no. I mean, I, I, it's a great introduction to chaos. And I liked the the drama of 
Loken having to shoot one of his own men because before this, the concept of a space marine killing another space marine is rare. I mean, we'll get into some stuff with the, uh, the space wolves or whatever, but like your average marine couldn't conceive of having to kill one of their brothers, and so yes. um, there's it was. I think they did a good job of showing that tragedy, and then that'll lead us to everything that's going forward. So I'm good. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. That's a great point. Yeah, there's something that was unheard of. Absolutely. Uh, so we move on now to part two of the book. It's called Brotherhood in Spider-Land, and you'll find out why in a moment. <laughs> uh, nothing to do with Spider-Man. Uh, and so after what happened on 6319, the crusade keeps going on, and they receive a distress call from planet 14020 which would be the 140th expedition fleet or one of the breakoff fleets from a larger expedition mm -hmm. and planet 20. And it's called murder. That's the, <laughs> the name of this planet that they've given it by a blood angels legion. Here we go. Okay. Introduced to another legion now. So we got the Luna wolves. We've got the blood angels. I just uh, feel like legion should not be up to the tourism department for naming stuff, man. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. So the captain from the blood angels, uh, um, Legion, because there's no chapters yet, chapters yep. come very much later, uh, says that he started, he, he stated that there was a really strange signal being transmitted around the planet, and then contacts lost with him. But hmm. he talked about some kind of a, and he didn't know what it was, but just some kind of a signal as they were getting closer, etc. Uh, two Legions respond to the message. So Horus's Luna Wolves and then the Emperor's Children, who are Fulgrim's Legion. Yep. So now we've got three legions we've talked about. Um, before the Luna Wolves get there, though, there's interesting things happening on the Luna Wolves ship, which is the Vengeful Spirit. Yes. Um, Loken discovers this interesting metal medallion, and it's a lodge ship medallion. This is the first time that I remember reading that lodges are mentioned. And I'm just telling you the first time, Doug, that I read that, I'm like, this cannot, there's something wrong here. I, I just knew it right away instinctively. <laughs> and then he found it among Jubal's possessions when he looked, mm -hmm. you know, for his sergeant stuff. And Lo it was weird because Loken had forbidden the Marines and his company to participate in these things. They're secret gatherings, these lodges are. Um, and so he uh, talks with Aximon about his distrust of the lodges and his distrust is based on the fact that they are secret. You know, this is something that soldiers universally don't like to have with people who have, they have to trust their back to. Yep. Um, and, but Axman was like, Hey, you know what? Why don't you come to a meeting? Why don't you see what it really is? And so Axman takes him to this thing. Torganon is there. It, it, Loka's like, what? You know, he didn't say anything, but he's like, oh, my God, Torgadon is here. Um, and so the lodges, as it's explained to Loken anyway, are for Astartes of any rank, officers, line troops. They can meet together as equals. You just disregard rank, say whatever you need to say. Uh, but again, they're secretive organizations. And, you know, it was weird, Doug, because I always thought the lodges came later. Yeah. You know, and so it's weird timing wise how it's mentioned here. It means that something's been going on. Well, and, and, it's always a weird timing thing because you think it has to do with a character we're going to learn about later in this book. Yeah, of course. Yeah. So what are your thoughts on, on the lodges and, um, you know, it's one of those things it, it is, uh, I, I see, Ending the last section of the book, um, like, you know, act part one or act one, whatever, uh, with with chaos being introduced and then starting with this lodge medallion of Jubal's. I was like, OK, so that's making the connection from this like existential threat to like it's like here, like there's a thing it's connected to it. Um, and then that just has a lot of intrigue. And obviously he's, he's against lodges, which on the surface just kind of sound like. I don't know, Legion clubs or whatever. And yeah. if you have certain area, you know, it's just anyone, you're all welcome. Come on in. We're going to swap stories. We're going to just talk our truths and yeah. we can hash a bunch of stuff out as an informal body of the army. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then 
the problem is, is that that creates an unregulated way to disseminate information, which is exactly how the tendrils of chaos got in without anyone having to actually stand up and be like, nope, <laughs> yep. Yep. because it's all unofficial and it's all in a down low and they are secretive. So one group might not even know what the other is talking about. There are lodges of super loyal space marines who are just like i don't know why we're told to do this but okay free punch and pie mm -hmm. and then there's other ones that are like immediately going down the path of darkness <laughs> sure yep yeah um it, i think it was just to isolate people and allow a space for uh subversive thought i sure. mean as a back end kind of thing but uh yeah that's that's my thoughts on the logic okay. right so <laughs> After his attendance at the lodges and, you know, his thoughts on that, he finds Cinderman um, a little bit later. And Cinderman's starting to have a little bit of difficulty with this Imperial Truth thing after what he saw literally on 6319. For sure. And obviously this has been something he's believed in his whole life. And so all of a sudden <laughs> this Imperial Truth thing, as he's like, I don't know. Yeah. And it was weird to see Cinderman in doubt to me. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, what if a pastor suddenly stops believing in God one day? You're like, well, it's the inverse. It's the exact inverse. <laughs> but right. Yeah. You're like, right. yep. <laughs> yeah. And um, so, so that was an interesting scene in, in the book. I thought it was, it's significant, I think, because of Cinderman's doubts. And then uh, somebody you mentioned before, uh, Mercedes Olatin, who is kind of Loken's therapist, as, as we said, <laughs> yeah. um, petitions Loken to sponsor Carcassi's work. Carcassi was that um, poet. Yep. And, um, you know, she really loves the fact that it's the raw truth. You know, it's non-politicized. It's just what he sees. And Loken says, yeah, you're right. Based on, I, and I think a lot of it has to, to do with what he's seen now in the whisper heads, what he's seen, you know, with the lodges and all these other things. Um, and so that, that takes place. Mm -hmm. And um, the weird thing about Keeler that I found really almost humorous in the book is they talked about how morally decadent she had been after 6319, because most people who know of Freedy Keeler, she's the saint, you know, Hands, yeah. hands pushed together, you know, and, <laughs> you know, it's like, what? She was sleeping around and she was drunk and yep. this is not the same Keeler that we think we know. But I think it's great that when you read the book, if you've had other experiences with the heresy, it's a great way to, to understand that even Keeler, even the saint is human and it gives her that human side uh, and so Logan comes to her because he's concerned. He started hearing these stories about her and, and her decadence. And she gives Logan, and this is a real act of faith here on her part. She gives Logan a, basically a, a camera that has a picture of what Jubal really looks like after yeah. he's transformed. And instead of releasing these pictures, which she could have done, she gave the you know pictures to him entrusted it to him yep. and because of what he's been told he's kind of he kind of is required to do away with her and silence her yes yeah uh, but but knowing loken as we do at this point in the story there's no freaking way he's gonna do that no no um, it's yes thank you for this massive inconvenience to me <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it is kind of weird like keeler was like okay just take this you know and it, she just put this huge burden on Loki. <laughs> yes and and then once he leaves now this is i think this is another in this story anyway it's a really um seminal moment is she has this when he leaves she opens this little secret shrine that she's made to the emperor and it's like she's praying to him. Yep. And you're going, whoa, wait a minute. Where did this come from? Because this is just huge. Like, yeah, you, you don't do this. Where did you even think you could do something like this? Um, it, wow. <laughs> that's, mm -hmm. yeah, that's eye opening when you see that happen. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. The introduction of, because I mean, that's the first time we, we get even that whiff of, 
like this i feel like the chapter is like the whiff of chaos being introduced through these secrets secret yeah. secrets are no fun and then um but also the worship and the deification of the emperor where it's just like both of those things end up being the defining features of Warhammer 40 K. Like, I mean, yes. Chaos triumphant, it split the galaxy in half. And then the deity of the emperor is everything. Sure. Um, sure. So I, I don't, it's, it's cool. I mean, it's, it's amazing that I feel like those hints are still there in the first book. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so it's kind of weird too how the chapter's written. So, we're with Loken. We're seeing yep. all these things happening with him and this interactions with the humans. But back on Murder, the planet we talked about, there's a lot mm-hmm. happening still. And so we kind of moved back to that because... Yeah, it did jump around a lot. <laughs> yeah, it was interesting. So the Emperor's children get there first. And there's a guy named Eidolon, who, again, is very prominent in the books going forward. Yes. And so Eidolon, being who he is, he goes in and just attacks and what they're attacking is these like arachnid, you know, hence Spiderland, arachnid type creatures. They call they're calling them mega arachnids. And so there are two companies that come in under Eidolon. One is led by Lucius, who will be very prominent, and Saul Tarvitz, who is to me an immediate favorite because of his personality and his style oh, yes. and everything else yes 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 um but the even the emperor's children are really hard pressed by these mega rachanids and one of the issues are is they can't communicate with each other because yep. there's electromagnetic storms that are going on and they can't figure out why they're going on they, they don't know what's happening so what it turns out is that these mega rachanids have been constructing these stone towers kind of think like mega stone hinges uh and it's keeping the Marines, it's inducing these storms. And what they're doing is they're impaling dead Marines on them, which you're like, that's weird, too. I almost got it. I don't think there's that um, chaos piece to it, but it seemed like that a little bit, you know, like some kind of sacrifice. Um, yeah. So that's the so Tarvitz then looking what's happening. He wants to destroy the towers because Tarvitz is a lot smarter than Eidolon or Lucius combined. Yes. And he wants to recover the bodies of his brothers. Uh, Eidolon's like, nah, let's not do that. Uh, but weird enough, when they follow Tarvitz's suggestion, they start blowing up the towers. Oh, guess what? Comms start to clear. Oh, well, imagine that. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, and it's just, it's just seeing that there's a practical purpose. Like, these are doing something, whereas the other guys are like, no, they just strung them up there to to decorate and psych us out. It's like, no, there's something weird happening. Yeah, <laughs> yeah and it took think so. to figure it out. Um, yeah. And then, so the Emperor's children and the Blood Angels have been doing whatever. The Luna mm-hmm. Wolves arrive, and they're led by Torgadon. So really, Loken isn't involved in any of this stuff on the surface. Yes. Yep. Um, Eidolon, of course, acting like the child he is. He's ungrateful. Uh, Lucius is like, I'm too perfect a warrior for any of this. And <laughs> Torgadon and Tarvitz, though, form a really good bond, a close bond, yep. which is what you would expect. Mm-hmm. Um, then, interestingly enough, two of the Primarchs, Horus, we know, Sanguinius, who is the Primarch of the Blood Angels, get into the fight, which was cool. That that part yes. of the story was so awesome because you saw you saw Primarchs really for the first time mm-hmm. in the battle. And it was pretty cool to see how they just wiped the floor with people. Yeah. Yeah. We, I, I like, um, it was pointed out, I think in the show, the independent characters that do a lot of 40 K stuff, at least they did um, that. Like when we read about how ridiculously murdery a space Marine is like, but a human compared to a space Marine is the same as a space Marine compared to a Primarch. Like yes. they're just this next level. <laughs> and so like yes. these guys who've been alive for hundreds of years and killed hundreds and thousands of people are watching their Primarch just like put him to shame. <laughs> you just, you kind of see, you, you know, all these space Marines standing around when the, when the Primarchs are engaged, if they didn't have helmets on their, their mouths would just be open. Yes. Like, <laughs> yep. uh... <laughs> So why are we here? (laughs) Where's the popcorn, man? I want to watch the show. God. So near the end of the fight with the mega arachnids, a fleet of ships arrives, interestingly enough, and they're humans and they call themselves the Interrex. And 
they ask, and this is just such a, a thing where, to your point earlier, you know, beating the heck out of something isn't always the answer. And no. humans, you know, the, the Imperium isn't always the smartest and the best. So these people literally, they ask the Space Marine fleets and the Primarchs are like, why did you ignore the warning beacons we had around this planet? And they kind of look at each other like, what are they talking about? What warning beacons? Well, if you recall earlier in our summary here, one of the Blood Angels captains said, there were these weird signals coming from around the planet. We didn't figure out what they were. But they were warning beacons to stay away from the planet, and shortly we're going to find out why. Mm -hmm. uh, Anything cool. else for for murder or any of the stuff that happened um, with... Mm -hmm. No, I liked it. Honestly, it was it fulfilled for me the the action requirements and it introduced yes. some of my favorite characters like yeah. um Salt Arvitz. Um uh. right, that's his name. Yeah. yeah. And then, um I honestly I I liked Lucius. I like him actually a lot in the Horus Heresy and I don't yes. in 40K, but uh mm. he's a fun character. Yeah, I and I know this is a reference to something outside of this, but I have to agree with you from one point where I'm reading the Abaddon novels, you know, 40K yeah. Abaddon novels, and Lucius is in those, you know, mm -hmm. it's kind of a mini spoiler, but I love the way he portrays his character in those. Yes. I never liked him before I read the Abaddon books, <laughs> but then when he's in those, it's like, Lucius is actually kind of a fun character. <laughs> yeah, he's like, there's always that one group and uh, one person in a friend group that you're like, man shut up <laughs> like <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> he just says something and everyone's like just shush <laughs> yeah so it, you're right there that was the action part of the book and it was well one of the action parts but it's definitely shows off the space marines and the mm -hmm. and the primarchs so that's murder and what we're gonna do is we're gonna move on to something called the dreadful sagittary and you know i made a note in in the stuff I sent to you, this to me in the entire 50 book plus series, this is one of the saddest parts of any Horace heresy book that I have read. It just is so sad to me the way mm -hmm. these th things end up working out. Um, so that was kind of a, just for listeners, you know, that was kind of a, a teaser there. So yep. that you keep listening. Uh, Serious mode. <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> It turns out that this signal that was being broadcast was a warning, and it turns out that murder was a penal colony created by the Interex to intern the Megarachinids. So it's like you just broke into a prison where we had these prisoners kept and started fighting with the prisoners. Like, what is your problem? Just an ordinary day here on Spider Prison. What the heck is this? It's the Great Crusade. You know, it's like you said, you know, just leave it alone. That that's what we learned on sixty three. Yes, Maybe yes. We just left it alone. <laughs> but, but no, Crusade. Oh, God. Um, so it's it, this is an interesting part to me too. This this part of the story. So they they give them that revelation, but. Horace, he just, this is the part of the story where you just get this whole side of how amazing he is as a leader, how noble he is, how much he considers the options, how thoughtful he is. And, you know, he shows a lot of humility, I think, in this part of the book and kind of says, you know, he apologizes yeah. to the Interex leaders, and of course, people like Abaddon and Eidolon are like, what the hell are you doing apologizing to these people? You're a Primarch. But yeah. Horus breaches that pride and that you know arrogance piece and shows who he really is, at least in this time of the story. And it was to me, it was very powerful to show him like that and show that Agreed. side of him. It, it was so wonderful um, to see. For me. Exactly. You know, I would totally agree. I think, um, you know, if if not sincerity, at least shows like statesmanship. Mm -hmm. um, I do think he was sincere yeah. about it. But, yeah. you know, I just like this is why he's the war master, because he can do it all. I mean, 
Yep. And, you know, he's not only the Primarch, but he's also just a representative of mankind now because he's now interacting with a human subset. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, absolutely. I thought it was great. Yeah, and he, um, you know, you hear other things as we're going through different books. You see him like at Ulanor when he was meeting with the other Primarchs and he would just walk up to somebody like Loken or whoever it was and just kind of put his hand on their shoulder and say, Hey, I heard you did this really well, you know, and you did this and it was really great to see you. And I'm really proud of you. And you're going, yeah, that's what a real leader does, you know, just, and you felt that I think in this part of the book. And unfortunately we're not going to feel that a whole lot longer. So (laughs) I, that's why it's so savor it. (laughs) So anyway, all the Astartes, they travel to the home world and they kind of, uh, are trying to negotiate for the Interrex to ally with them. And again, you've got a lot of the legions uh, saying, uh, no, let's just, oh, here we go again, conquer the planet and move on. You know, let's not just leave them alone. Let's just, just ally with them and let them be. And if we need them, they'll be there. Let's let's conquer them. Let's occupy their, um, occupy their planet. And, it's weird because for some reason that we'll find out the Interrex are not really interested in allying with the Imperium. Right. Um, and during the negotiations, uh, Horus meets with his Mournival, his four people. Mm-hmm. Um, and he, again, he expresses some regret. You see this different side of him on the way the 6319 contact resolved itself. You know, you, you can see him having some regrets that he didn't, negotiate more that he didn't approach them differently um and you really see that he wants to do all peaceful means that he can to bring the interrex on board he wants to exhaust every option before resorting to conquest again based on that experience Mm -hmm. um and it's weird because this is in direct conflict with the emperor yes um saying xenos races need to be destroyed and what's weird about that is the interrex are humans (laughs) like they're not really aliens right but to take them into the imperium they they can't have spider prison you got to kill like you have to be on board with all of it so it's their entire worldview and stuff yeah yeah so uh, that's where we are so far and um but at this point it's pretty you end up seeing that the party is over essentially so they have a party Mm -hmm. they have a reception uh, a kind of a diplomatic reception yeah. and Loken's talking to one of the Interrex guards and he mentions a word. Here we go. Chaos. K A O S is how they spell it. I believe in the book. Mm-hmm. Um, and he said the Interrex learned this from the Eldar and they learned about the insidious nature of this chaos thing. Um, and remember that Loken talked to Horus and Horace, when he was explaining about what happened at the Whisperhead, said there's no ultimate evil. Right. There, there is not. That That's just craziness. Um, but the chaos that the guard starts describing matches perfectly with Loken's experiences on 6319. Mm-hmm. And so it, it's interesting because there's this point in the conversation where the guard says, oh, yeah. And Loken says, oh, yeah. And you see this really cool uh, connection, kind of diplomatic and social connection made between the two men. Um, but before they can kind of say, hey, everybody, we figured it out. We need to get together. <laughs> um, there's an alarm. Something's happened. Uh, there's been a break in at one of the artifact museums on the planet. Mm-hmm. And, of course, the Interrex tell Horus that his Astartes have stolen something called an anathema. So do you want to talk to us what an anathema is? Uh, Sure. So um, it is like a cosmic negative, I don't know, yin to a yang kind of a thing. Um, The actual item, if I'm not mistaken, it's like a sword that it can pretty much kill anything. Mm -hmm. Um, And if you... Is this the one where, like, if you if you have a name that you want somebody dead, you can... You could do that, yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, can kill... We know that it's implied, at least, that it could kill a Primarch if it was used. Yeah. 
Um, I, I think I probably like the simplest way, like demon weapon. You know, just yeah, whatever there you whatever go. fantasy or sci fi genre you you come from. That's kind of the idea. <laughs> Hell's dagger. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah, it's like a cursed item or something. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, so they believe they've stolen an anathema. And Horace, of course, doesn't know anything about this because it's none of his Marines. Yep. Uh, but it doesn't matter. And conflict um, erupts, military conflict. And Horace still is trying. He's grasping for peace here. He wants to do this peacefully. But the Interrex just are not interested anymore. And yep. can you blame them? Doug? No. Because we know they are well aware of what's going on here. Uh, and so he is forced to rally his forces and to fight back. Yep. Again, you get this beautiful picture of Horace being the quintessential leader. And, you know, I didn't want to have to do this. This is not what was supposed to happen. But I'm going to protect my people. I'm going to do what I need to do. Um, and after the battle, interestingly enough, because they did win the battle yep. <laughs> pretty easily, um, Sanguinius, who was there, you know, the other the other legions were there, um, had this conversation with Horus. He said, you know, after your very uh, noble you know, efforts and all the things that you've done, um, you should rename your legion. And he suggests that he renames the Lunar Wolves the Sons of Horus. And again, in keeping with Horus's uh, personality at the time, he's very hesitant to do that. Yep. And he's like, thank you, brother. You know, he, he really loves and respects Sanguinius, but he's like, nah, I don't think so. I, I don't think we need to do that. Um, so, so that's kind of what happened at the reception and afterwards and all these things are going on. This anathema was supposedly stolen. Um, after the battle, interestingly enough, Logan goes to his therapist <laughs> Mercedes all with him yep. um, and kind of talks about what happened and the battle and everything else and it's just beautiful because you know he, he has all these amazing memories of Horace his dignity, his humility, his courage his nobility and he remembers these parts of Horace he has these beautiful memories of his Primark in his head, they're never going to go away no matter what happens. And I think that's really neat that that part of, of uh, Horace remains with some people. Mm -hmm. So uh, the conversation continues. And then all of a sudden Mercedes asked Logan, like, where are we going next? You know, this is kind of done. We're moving on. He goes, well, you know, Chaplain Erebus from the word bearers, who is a guest aboard our ship, um, he says that we're going to be heading to a moon around a planet, a moon called Davin. And you go, oh, okay. Now, anybody who knows anything about the yes. heresy is like, oh, God, there's the D word, right? It's going to be great. <laughs> <laughs> but if you haven't, if you're, you're joining us to kind of start your heresy journey, Davin is one of the planets in the heresy that has, it has its name written in infamy. So, um, again, one of the images we see here at the near the end of the book is you – flashback to Ifrady Keeler praying at her secret shrine and thanking the emperor for Horus and for his legions, you know, but again, she's in prayer. She's thankful. Uh, she is now definitely an emperor botherer, as some people would say, <laughs> she's an emperor <laughs> worshiper. Yes. Um, forbidden, forbidden, which is why this is a secret shrine. Yep. Um, you know, and, it, I guess the book kind of almost ends. It almost ends. So we've got we've got the birth of the heresy here, even though it isn't the heresy yet, Doug. Um, yep. So we know that the anathema was in fact stolen, and it was stolen by Erebus. So uh, there's some very strong indications that Erebus has been in league with the dark powers for some time. This isn't a new mm -hmm. thing, you know. And remember, this has been going on for 200 years. This crusade. For so sure. When you understand that, you can you can understand that. Yeah, you know what, Erebus might have been working on this for a while, um, mm -hmm. and then in the final scene, he, he's in the of course 
he's in the dark depths. You know, we talked <laughs> about the secrecy of the medallions and the lodges for sure. the vengeful spirit. And he's kind of communing with his new masters, you know, like trying to figure out, Oh, what can I do? What, how can I use this thing that I've stolen? Because obviously it has some kind of power mm -hmm. um, and you're just going, Oh man. Yeah. Oh. Um, my thoughts on Arabit, I don't know if he was necessarily into chaos before Logar. I don't think so. Um, but okay. between the two of them, I do think Logar took it in a more ideological way of like what chaos should be. And that's why he, he does a lot of actions of course, but like um, I feel like Erebus was more of the mover and shaker to turn the, to pivot the history of the Imperium towards this rather than being one person's personal beliefs on worship like Lorgar. Right, right. Um, okay. So, yeah, he definitely seems like the better, the bigger of the movers and shakers. How about that? <laughs> yeah, no, fair enough. Um, yeah, and I, I, fantastic book, and thank you so much for that that summary of it. Um, final, final thoughts for you as you kind well, of think about the close. There's a few other characters I think it's worth mentioning. Yeah. Um, we have Ralderon, who's the chapter master, of the blood angels uh, because remember we still had primarchs back then. And so, but he plays a part in this and especially on the murder scenes um, you have a act and Cruz who's a captain in the Luna wolves. He's an older space Marine. He's been around a long time. Yes. Uh, but he plays such a crucial role later that I think it's worth us mentioning to the leaders that name. So remember I act and Cruz because he will come up again you have uh, Varvarus, who's the Lord Commander of the Imperial Army. Yep. He will be very important in the next few books. And then this last character is so important. His name is Regulus, and he is a representative of the Martian Mechanicum. Mm -hmm. And he will play a huge role when we get to the Mechanicum book and we start talking about things that go on on Mars. Uh, so Regulus is there with the expedition fleet and um, obviously kind of observing, I think, more than anything of what's happening. But those are some other characters to just think about. Overall, it's just such a great way, I believe, you know, as a summary to introduce really a lot of different characters, but just give you little pieces and parts to understand a little bit about how they're developing or what they might become. Yeah, that's what I really like about it. You know, it gives you a flavor like, who's Lucius? Oh, well, you can kind of figure it out pretty quick who Lucius is. You can figure out who Eidolon is. And mm -hmm. you know what Loken's like or Saul Tarvitz or, you know, any character that you can pick, you kind of know what they're going to be in the future from the way Dan wrote this. And I think that's really a neat way to introduce characters. There's so much foreshadowing. It's just this book is just drenched in it. Um, for sure. For sure. But, I, I... Uh, oh, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, I, I think there was a great job of like just picking up on some of the themes, um, mm -hmm. secrets that sink the whole thing. Obviously, you know, there's secrets that are okay, quote unquote, with like yeah. the lodges, sure. but then there's secrets that are not like Erebus stealing a demon weapon or something, <laughs> you know, like, yeah. but, but if you allow some secrets and not others, you know, it just gets really murky and, and they plunge themselves into this darkness. I also like when I first read the book many, many years ago, um, I kind of got lost in like, you know, like name salad. They just, they just throw a ton of names at you. Sure. Um, but realistically it's, you know, Horus, the Morn of all. And then if you meet characters from other legions, you usually, I, I feel like you meet multiples of them. So you can see how the heresy unbinds them internally as well. Yeah. Like we meet Saul Tarvitz. We also meet Lucius and they're from the same, they're both emperor's children and really yes. good at what they do, but they're different. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. so it kind of like sets up division stories in the future, which yeah. I mean, for the first book in something as comprehensive as the Horus heresy went on for 60 more, like <laughs> it was a great introduction. <laughs> sure. Sure. Yep. Great, great book, great stories. And um, yeah, just right on. Just good stuff, man. Cool. Great. Well, um, I will. Uh, we're kind of moving towards show close here, but we do have a few questions uh, from folks on the interwebs. And if you want to ask a question to us, like I said before, leave it in the comments of this video on YouTube or whatever podcasting app um, 
I also you can also email me at Doug at degriggs at two plus tough dot com. And uh, so today's questions, let me just pull them up here. Uh, one thing we didn't clarify, a few people asked this, is what is our general general release structure going to look like? And mm-hmm. uh, we we were thinking every two weeks ish, right? Is that about right? Yeah, I think that's what you had talked about. It's fine. It's good. Yeah, cool. Um, we were called out in a YouTube comment for not uh, for the sin of not praising Aaron Dembski Bowden enough. <laughs> okay. when we when we mentioned our favorite authors i was like oh ben counters my boy <laughs> well we're gonna make up for that listener because we're gonna talk about the magnificence that is the book the first heretic so we will more than yep. make up for not calling him out so yes plus i i praise him endlessly enough uh you know <laughs> online and twitter and stuff I, I, he knows he knows he is beloved <laughs> yep. um we had one um a direct question uh, from Behemoth's Boy over on my, uh, what do you call it, Discord, and uh, asked, what is your favorite mark of ter- of armor? Mm. Wow. If you're not familiar. How about, like, how about you? Uh, I'm going to go with Mark Three, And if you don't know what that is, if you look up like old Horus Heresy Space Marine armor, there's one that looks like it has like a, a feudal era kind of helmet. <sighs> With like the like the little slits in the front, kind of mm-hmm. like an old school knight. That is my absolute favorite. It, it just kind of cool. personifies the space fantasy that is Warhammer rather than science fiction. <laughs> yes. I think um, Beaky's, I think it's Mark's. Yeah? yeah all right. That's my favorite. I, I just, when I saw it first come out, it was like, that is really, and I can remember my first Space Marine armies, you know, those are my choices for helmets. They're one of the choices when I played 40 K and it's like, well, these are kind of cool. I, I kind of wondered where they came from. And then once I read the books, it's like, Oh yeah. Mark six. Okay. So yeah, I like the beakies a lot and they're a big thing in the Raven guard. And I, I'm, I like the Raven guard a lot too. So right on, right on. Okay. So awesome. Uh, those are all the questions we have. We had one suggestion for, for talking about how legions change over time, but we'll mm-hmm. have to cover those, uh, when we talk about individual legions. So, sure. Absolutely. um, what I'm going to do ahead is close out the show. And, uh, for our next episode, we always wanted to let people know what we're going to be doing next. If you wanted to follow, uh, we're going to be doing the second book in the series. Which one is that again? False gods, false gods. Yes. I always get two and three backwards in my head. I don't know oh, why. Yeah. Yep. Uh, so we're doing false gods next time. And, uh, again, if you have any questions from book one or want to ask questions about false gods, throw them on anywhere you can. Uh, Dan, any last uh, thoughts for the day? No, I think we're good. And thanks again for, for, you know, putting this all together and thank you listeners for joining us. We're just so excited to be able to do this. And, um, yeah, it, it's just such a great thing to, um, kind of reminisce a little bit as you, we go through all these things we read years ago and kind of rediscover. That's the other fun part of this mm-hmm. is seeing things or remembering things that I never remembered before I read the book again. So absolutely. It's, it's fun. Yeah. Well, sweet. Thank you all so much for for watching and or listening, depending on whatever. And uh, we will catch you next time. Until then, the Emperor protects.